world. Today, I'm here with big data entrepreneur, Alan Gannett, who is not only famous for overturning the mythology around being a creative genius, but is also founder of TrackMaven, which in October 2018 merged with Skyward to form the number one content marketing platform. Now, Alan also co-founded Accelerprise, the leading SaaS startup accelerator, and is the author of The Creative Curve, a book about developing the right idea at the right time, which we'll certainly get into later. Now, <laughs> Alan's book is so sought after that it's available in eight languages, and it's been featured on CNBC, Inc., Business Insider, and so much more. Alan, wow, <laughs> what an honor to have you on this show. My question to you now to kick off is, are you ready to get radically transparent with me? Totally. I mean, that was such a nice intro. I feel like very affirm. I'm going to like, <laughs> call my therapist and fire him right now. I don't need any more. Like, I'm good. Just, just play that on repeat. Start your day with affirmation <laughs> of, you know, Jen and radically transparent in your head and you're good to go. <laughs> good to go. Totally. <laughs> awesome. So thanks for joining us today on the show. And I, you know, there's a lot that we're going to dive into today. And, you know, I've definitely done my homework and I've watched a few of your interviews. I think you're phenomenal. Um, oh, and, and there's a lot, I wish we had more time than just our 30 minute segment, because there's a lot to dive into. And I think what you're exploring is worth more than 30 minutes. So maybe we'll have <laughs> to have you back. Um, but just to like hop into it, right. And, and throw you, throw you one real fast, right. Could you give us, and here's the challenge, a brief, <laughs> because I know there is oh so much, but a brief look at your professional journey and and how you got to where you are today, maybe I'll throw out maybe the idea for track maven or just, you know, there's so much to unpack here, but a brief little ex explanation <laughs> of that would be great. Yeah. So I've always been really fascinated by basically applying systems thinkings to things that don't seem systematic. Uh, and so that's sort of taken a few different paths over the years. So like, my first job was I ran marketing for a small startup that helped people um, basically use research from positive psychology in their hiring practices. So again, sort of hiring is one of these things that feels very sort of obtuse and organic and applying some science and rigor to that. And when I was doing that, I had this observation that so much of marketing this back in 2011 was you know, generating all this data now. And that data actually could give us a lot of clues around what was working, what was not working, what we should do more of, what we should do less of. And so I was starting to build these manual reports and I was like, this is not a good use of time. <laughs> and so um, TrackMaven really came out of that need I had as a marketer to gather data and draw insights from it, which meant sort of bring it all in one place and having context to it. And so started TrackMaven, um, you know, we grew really quickly. So, you know, I think we went, you know, we went, we were in the millions of revenue within, you know, sort of 12, 24 months type of thing. And, um, you know, in doing that, as you were growing that business, I was spending a lot of time with marketers and creatives. And I was noticing that there was a lot of sort of angst and woe among marketers and creatives more broadly about this idea of like, oh, am I that creative or am I creative even? And so I started doing this talk about some of the myths around creativity and debunking them. People seem to really like the talk and sort of it snowballed into a book. So the book came out in 2018, it's called The Creative Curve. It's all about the mythology around creativity and the truth behind how we can become more creative. Um, interviewed 25 sort of living creative greats, interviewed a lot of the leading academics and scientists who study creativity and sort of try to bring something that's very substantive, but also um, fun to read. And so, after we merged TrackMaven with Skyward, I stayed there for a bit. And then I left last year. And now I essentially spend my time, I'm on a bunch of you know writing projects. And then I do a lot of startup investing. So I invest in early stage um, companies, invest in over 50 and spend a lot of my time sort of helping those CEOs and um, you know, sort of helping them figure out you know, their biggest problems and how to fix them. Well, I think, I think that's a good place to be. Um, I can definitely share, you know, Octopus, a startup, a mighty startup that we are. Um, there's a lot of work to be done there. And so I can't imagine <laughs> what you're doing right now is anything um, easy, right? There's always a challenge there. So I want to get back to your book in a moment because I do have some pending questions after reading a bit about it. Um, <laughs> but I want to ask you, you know, when I'm thinking about what you're doing today and you're helping uh, early stage 
startups and, and kind of even interpreting data and looking at data. And I know you said you were looking to kind of take like non-process, I guess, flows, if you will, use data <laughs> and they kind of bring that all together. But what what's keeping you up at night these days professionally? Uh, I want to dive into that a bit. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think professionally, you know, there's, there's always the things that come up, you know, when writing those deadlines and, you know, trying to make those deadlines. I think in a lot of the projects I do, you know, nowadays, there's a tension or a push pull around, you know, I've always been very extroverted. I, you know, very fast to make new friends. But yet I, so I always like meeting new people, but I also really like my friends and, and in the work I do, there's sort of a very blurry overlap between my sort of personal life and professional life. So like investing, I tend to invest in friends in the writing, I tend to get a lot of help from friends. And so I feel some tension between, you know, a lot of the things I do are sort of about, you know, the larger of the sort of group of people you have behind you or in your corner, the more effective you can be as a tech investor, for example. Um, but also it's harder and harder to like, it, you know, have those relationships and have them be deep and meaningful and all that kind of stuff. So I think for me, there's sort of like, if I think about the next 10 years of my career, where we're living in an age, that's very interconnected and very uh, community oriented. I'm sort of still processing how to handle that. Like, like, do I, at a certain point, do I have to give up on meeting new people? Like, I, I don't, I don't, I haven't quite wrapped my head around how to reconcile that. And most of what I do now professionally is sort of driven based on sort of like extended network sort of stuff. Um, and so that's something I sort of am grappling with right now. I think, listen, that's interesting. And, you know, for me coming from the social world, I think what's really interesting, right, is that, you know, as Jen, I'm this very social person. And then you come to social media and I almost find sometimes getting very frustrated with social <laughs> because I think some of the best social media is actually written by introverts or written by people who are oh, yeah. way more comfortable behind the screen. And they have these wild, crazy brands online. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm envious of them because I think they're, you know, that that's something to me that I've seen a shift, right? In the kind of the way in the way we were. I've met some people <laughs> who are like Twitter famous in real life and they're super awkward, not in like a judgmental way, just like in the definitional sense of the word. And it's like really jarring because I'm like, well, but on like Twitter, you sort of, but I think it reminds me of how stand up comedians often are very depressed and sad, right? And they're very awkward socially, sort of one on one, but on stage, it's like this outlet for them. And I think Twitter is sort of that equivalent of that for a lot of introverts, which is, you know, it's great. I think, I mean, I think the, the optimistic case around social media is that it's a place for people to express themselves and connect, right? Like that's the, the optimistic case. There's lots of flaws. I think there's a lot of flaws in social media, you know, I'm, which I'm happy to talk about. But I think if you look at what is sort of the positive outcomes of social media, that idea that people can, you know, express and connect is really valuable. I, I agree. And I think it definitely, it opened, the world is a very connected place. And I think social makes it much smaller, which I do really love. Um, okay. So now, now that I know that what keeps you up at night professionally, which I think all of us do struggle with, you know, from, from time to time, I want to hop back to the book because we've all been, been spoon fed, I think our entire lives, the notion that you're either born a creative genius or you're not, right? Like you're either in a gifted class or you're with the regulars, right? Looking at your LinkedIn profile, I like to think you were actually born one um, because <laughs> what you've been doing to me is just pure genius. Um, but you seem to have proof that you don't need to be born a creative genius to actually become one or be one. So my question to you right now is, in your opinion, or in the data you might have, can creativity be taught? Yes. Full stop. Like, absolutely. I mean, hey, you know, you and, and, yeah, I'll dive into it. So um, there's a few different ways to sort of think about this or approach this. So one, so let me set the stage. You know, one is that often we talk about creativity and genius being very intertwined. And in fact, there's this finding in psychology called the threshold theory, which is basically above a relatively average IQ threshold. We actually all have the same creative potential. We all have the same creative potential. So you get an IQ of you know, 120 or 160 of the same creative potential. But then the question is, okay, that means billions and billions of people have roughly similar amounts of creative potential, 
But obviously creative achievement is not that widespread, right? So why is there this big gap between potential and achievement? And really, if you wanted to like boil down my book, it's all about understanding that gap and closing that gap. And so the, the fundamental things that's interesting is you start to look at, okay, who are the people who've achieved, right? And what are the lessons we can draw from them? There's a, there's a, there's a lot of them. One of them, for example, is that you start to realize that creativity is three things. It's okay. not, it's not one thing. We often think of it just as skill, right? Like creativity, like painting, right? It's like the, the, the craft of painting, but that's not true because if it was simply being a technically proficient painter or a technically really skilled painter, there's lots of painters in every generation of painters who are just completely, you know, they can paint a perfect reproduction of the Mona Lisa, but it's not creative. What creativity is, it's the combination of craft, timing, and distribution. You have to have the technical skill to execute on the right idea at the right time and have the distribution to actually get recognized. So once you start to sort of see that framework and see the dynamic, you start to realize well, all three of those things are things you get better at. So let's look at craft, for example. When you look at most people who you know, are sort of wildly successful in a craft-driven creative field, what you see is you tend to see that they start very young. And the reason they start very young is usually if you look at their history, not because they were like drawn to it as a three-year-old, but because they had a parent who forced them. Or oftentimes you see them sort of, you know, using it as some sort of escape hatch from some sort of, you know, uh, intense or, you know, problem childhood or, you know, whatever you want to call it. So you see that, you know, Mozart's a great example. Mozart had essentially a helicopter dad and his helicopter dad made him, you know, play the piano starting at the age of three for three hours every single day. Like that, that is going to make you good at piano. You know, there's a whole thing around neuroplasticity and how our brain works, but we have this bias where, you know, we sort of get that if I go to the gym and I do bicep curls, my biceps will get bigger. Our brain is actually very functionally similar. So, you know, if you do certain tasks, your brain over time adapts to those tasks. And that's because every day your brain generates thousands of new brain cells. And those brain cells are sort of attracted to the parts of your brain that are most active is sort of a way to think about it. So this is why neuroplasticity mm -hmm. exists. This is why you know, people who have strokes can often recover certain functions because other parts of their brains can grow to compensate for those parts of their brains that sort of died off. So neuroplasticity is a really important element that's not understood. The second element, timing. Timing is this thing that we think of as very magical. But what I talk about and explore in my book is that being really great at timing is really around understanding what is out there. And so what you find is that the most successful creatives are also massive consumers of their niche. So they're not on Twitter, you know, learning a little bit about a lot of things, but instead they go very, very deep. So, you know, the jazz musician listens to every single jazz record imaginable. Um, and this is true across any creative field. I mean, think about Twitter, right? The people who are best at Twitter spend all day on Twitter, right? Because you have to understand you have to understand what's going on. What's the conversation? What's the meme? What's fresh? What's not fresh? And there's a whole framework that I explain in my book, which is basically that the ideas that tend to take hold creatively tend to be ideas that are the right tension, the right balance point of the familiar and the novel, of the old and the new. Mm -hmm. And being deep in a specific sector allows you to learn what those are. And the third element, marketing and distribution. I mean, that is really an element where obviously as marketers, we sort of get, but you know, if you are a really skilled painter, even if you have the right idea at the right time, if no one sees it, it's actually logically impossible to determine whether or not your idea is creative. Creativity relies on social recognition. And so as a result, if you just create in a forest and no one ever sees it, right? Like it didn't exist. And so those three things are really the bedrock of creativity. And all three of those things are things you can nurture, learn, and get better at. So besides reading your book, because I would encourage everyone <laughs> to go grab a copy, what is one maybe task or exercise or, or piece of advice you could give to marketers listening in to kind of jumpstart becoming a genius? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, you know, first of all, I'd say that 
one thing I see with people, like, I think it's very different when you're trying to learn a skill as a child or an adult. Okay. And so obviously as a child, you know, oftentimes we don't have as much autonomy over our decisions, how we spend our time. And so our parents can push us to do certain things. Our environment can push us to do certain things. School can push us to do certain things. As an adult, we don't have that. And the thing that's really, I think we're really conscious of as adults is that usually the first stages of something are the hardest. So, you know, the whole, the whole sort of like find your passion thing is BS because like, you know, people are sort of looking for something that's very easy the first time they do it. And the reality is there's nothing that is very easy the first time you do it that's worth doing in my mind. And so as a result, like actually the only thing that's easy in the beginning is video games. And video games are literally designed to take advantage of this human tendency. So as a result, like the beginning stages of anything are really hard, really difficult. And so how do you get through that as an adult? And so one of the things I really, you know, talk to a lot of people about, and I think is especially true for marketers, is you need to have a creative community of people in your field. This is so important because these people, A, apply some social pressure to you. There's some friendly competition. There's some accountability. There's empathy. There's a sense of just, wow, if I, you know, I don't want to let these people down. I want to fit in in the group. I want to keep going. And so I find that people who are successful at sort of developing a creative skill later in life tend to do a really good job, whether that's in painting or writing or marketing of building a creative community around themselves to give them that accountability, that push and that little, that little something that I think is really necessary to developing a new skill as an adult. I love that. It, it's almost like you're describing CrossFit for marketers. Marketing. <laughs> like I hear that. Totally. I mean, right, this that is why communities culture. are, yeah, this is why communities are so powerful, right? Like this is because like they have all these dynamics and they, they, they push us and we want to stay in the group. We want to do the things that are the norms of the group. And so if you build a community around you, people where the norms are about being creative, you're naturally going to feel some accountability towards working on those things and developing those things. Makes sense. And I think that's why people probably enjoy working on teams so much or, or marketers at least. because it, Yeah. A hundred percent together, right? Like you put a marketer alone in a room, they probably would go crazy. <laughs> um. <laughs> by the way, that's, it's true with engineers too. I mean, you know, we talk about engineers as this very solo thing, but in reality, like engineers mostly like working on teams, they do pair programming, right? Like it's a very like core evolved biological sort of tendency. And I think it's important to lean into those tendencies when you're aware of them. Agreed. Agreed. Now I want to shift the conversation for a moment um, to failure. Uh, I think right, failure is an inevitable part of success. Um, and I'm curious, would you be able to share a time in your life when perhaps you thought you failed big time or you made a giant mistake, but in actuality, it wasn't a failure at all and it helped you get where you are today? Yeah. So um, it's interesting because, you know, I think my perspective on failure is, you know, th they're always sort of, yeah, they're always lessons. So like, I, you know, I struggle with the word failure because, you know, I think of a lot of it is around like, did you give your best effort? Um, but, you know, I do a lot of, I, you know, now I'm sort of like full time doing sort of independent projects and trying stuff, experimenting. And a lot of those projects never see the light of day. Um, so something that like no one knows, for example, they'll tell you is like, I, um, had a TV pilot that a studio picked up. We did a, you know, we did a pilot, you know, sort of a really sort of credible production company and, the uh, you know, the pilot eventually we like ended up showing it to a lot of networks. There was some interest and ended up not getting made. And, you know, for me, it was something I spent a lot of time on. Um, and it was like a lot of, you know, work. But at the end of the day, it was when those things were like, you know, it's like it happens and it's part of the process. And I learned a lot about how TV and sort of that part of the media landscape works and like what it takes and what, what happens. And you know, one of my big lessons is that when you're doing creative project, it's very hard to know exactly what's going to work or what's not going to work. You know, you can sort of get in the right, and this is I talk about this in my book, you can get in the right sort of zone. And then there's a little bit of like, you know, do you sort of catch it? Does the right person sort of see you? And those things you can prepare for and you can get better at, but you can't be perfect at. 
And obviously you look at Apple, for example, and you look at their series of products and the things they've launched, they haven't all been successful. And so our goal is not to be successful 100% of the time. I think if you're successful 100% of the time, you're probably not trying hard enough, but our goal is to be successful 60% of the time, more times than not. And when you make those bets, when you do those projects to have them have the right sort of um, risk reward structure, so to speak. I don't mean rewards, you know, on a monetary basis necessarily, although those are good too, but rather in terms of like how they'll impact you emotionally, professionally, creatively, um, you know, for example, like doing the TV show, like the downside wasn't, there wasn't much downside, right? It's like, I like learned some interesting things, spent some time, you know, met a bunch of interesting people. Um, and the reward, you know, could, could have been really, really large. Um, and so like, you know, it's about taking a lot of bets, but having those bets more often than not be good bets. You know, I, I really appreciate you sharing that because I think as marketers as well, and especially after 2020, when we're all kind of, you know, we've pivoted and are we pivoting again, going into hybrid model and what's working on different channels, yeah. you know, there is kind of this value behind risk-taking, but also a value behind failure. And I think as marketers, it's a fine art or perhaps science of being able to balance <laughs> the two, right? And so I really appreciate you sharing that piece of kind of, you know, what failure means to you and, and about the pilot as well. Um, maybe we'll- Interestingly, I find that people tend to fit into different two different categories on this. Um, we're like, I am much more anxious about personal failings than professional failings. And yeah. I find people tend to fit into one of those two buckets. Like a lot of people like the idea of professionally failing at something is like really distressing. I'm like, okay, like, you know, like I, it just doesn't, just doesn't phase me for whatever reason. Uh, but the idea of like letting a friend down, like really messes me up. And so like, it's interesting. I think like we all have our different um, sort of emotional biases that impact our work. And I think what's important is like, for example, for me, I have to, um, you know, basically create deadlines and projects that are human driven deadlines because most of my work is independent now. And so like, because I know I really don't like letting people down, right? The way I sort of get stuff done is like setting deadlines with people and being like, okay, I'm gonna get this to you by this date. I'm really good at that motivating me. And so I think a lot of times, um, you know, we should think about our emotional biases as things that, you know, A, of course we wanna like change over time and like have better relationships with it, but also in the meantime, how can you use them to be sort of the best version of yourself, I think is also a very useful tool. You know what I love about this conversation? I think it's the first um, guest that we've had, not only get radically transparent, um, but also be really just real about being authentically you. And just really, cause what I'm hearing throughout each answer is you really have to know yourself to be able to do all of this and, and know yourself well enough to know what drives you, uh, what kind of the ripe moments to jump in. And I really appreciate that as well, because I think everybody's, we're all here on a journey. Um, and I think marketers, right, we're all also uh, constantly learning, but we can also sometimes get distracted by, you know, ooh, the shiny new things, or, you know, like you said, trying to fit in or that, that, um, little competitive, friendly, competitive uh, spirit among other marketers. But I do think that there's a lot of value to what you're sharing in that knowing yourself and what drives you, whether it's personal or professional, you know, that's one way to, to really become successful in whatever it is you do. Yeah. And you know, I won't claim to be, I won't claim to be self-aware, but one thing I found in my interviews, I thought was really interesting for the book was like, one of the traits among successful creative people very much was like self-awareness and you know an example i like to give and obviously i didn't interview these people but like um if you think about like steve jobs for example you know steve jobs was self-aware on day one that he was not technical enough to build apple computers so he had steve wozniak and they actually raised vc money very early and had multiple employees very early because he knew like that wasn't what he was good at and i think a lot of times when we're looking for creative collaborators, especially as marketers, we sort of look for people who we like gel with, who we're like, we enjoy. And like, that's not actually what you're looking for. You're looking for people who can fill in your weaknesses, which obviously requires you being aware of your weaknesses. And okay. so I think for a lot of people, it's like, you know, you sort of have to like grasp this idea that creativity is a team sport. It's okay for you to not have all the answers, right? Like JK Rowling doesn't know how to, 
you know, market her own books, right? The publishers have a marketing team, right? She knows how to write, but by the way, she also has editors and copy editors and cover designers, right? So like, we all have a set of skills. And I think for a lot of people, because we're so, you know, we've signed up, so to speak, for this sort of media portrayal of creativity, which is Steve Jobs on a mountain doing all of this stuff by himself, rolling a boulder up his hill, you know, up a hill on his shoulders, which is just complete baloney, right? Like he had thousands and thousands and thousands of engineers, same thing with Elon Musk, you know, he had thousands of, he has thousands of engineers working on these things. And you think that he's like designing the rocket all by himself, right? And so we have this media portrayal of creativity, which I think has negatively affected us. And I think breaking free of that is really important if you want to be creatively successful. Agreed. I, I, don't, I don't think anyone could have said it better. I have my last question. Well, you know what? I'll call it my last question and a half. I have like full question and a half question. So the full last question is, you know, anyone can Google you and see a list of your accomplishments, learn a little bit about you. I know I had done my due diligence and with every article or video I had watched, I was like, wow, Alan, this is, this man is incredible. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> and so I'm wondering if there's something you might be able to share with us today that you can't learn if we were to Google you or if we were to look at your LinkedIn profile. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, one sort of thing that is interesting that I, I don't, you know, quite, I think, like, this sort of interesting is, you know, I'm na- my name is Alan, right? Um, but I'm, you know, I'm half, my mom immigrated from Turkey, and I'm half Turkish. And, um, you know, I, I don't have a super strong connection back to Turkey. Um, and I think, I think that's something that's sort of interesting for me and think about, like, identity is, like, I have a very sort of, like, traditional American name. Um, but you know, as a percentage basis, I'm more Turkish than anything else. Every, the other stuff is sort of more mixed. And so that's something where I think a lot about, and I haven't had enough time to really noodle on it, but this idea of like identity and sort of how the world sees us, how we see ourselves and the sort of interrelationship between that, I think is really interesting. It's something that like, I want to like spend more time, um, thinking about because, you know, if my parents had given me a different name, how would the world see me? Would it be different? Would I be different? Would I act differently? And so I think. I think that that to me is something that I'm I'm sort of I'm starting to noodle on, um, and I think there's some interesting stuff there, but I haven't yet you know fully noodled on. Are you foreshadowing your next book on the Radical <laughs> Podcast? No, <laughs> I I know my next book topic. That's not it, but maybe that's oh. book three. <laughs> Can you give us a hint, or is it still a secret? Uh, it's still a secret for now. It come, it's gonna. It doesn't come out for a while, so you know. All right, all right. Well, with that, <laughs> we'll close out the show by saying we should all go follow Alan, so that that way we know when his next project <laughs> comes out. But with that, my half question is: usually after this podcast, people want to know more about uh, the guests on the show and and connect. What would be uh, the best way to connect or follow? Where are you most active, and uh, how can we reach you? Yeah, if you go to Alan, A-L-L-E-N dot X-Y-Z, I have links to book, newsletter, social media. LinkedIn is sort of the platform I have the biggest audience on and spend the most time on. Um, but I'm, you know, I use all the things. So yeah, and my email's on there. If anyone has questions, feel free to hit me up. Fantastic. Alan, thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. Have a great day. Thanks for tuning in to the Radically Transparent podcast brought to you by Octopost, the only social media management and employee advocacy platform architected for B2B. I'm Jennifer Gutman, your host and director of social strategy here at Octopost. And if you love today's show, we'd love if you subscribe, rate, and give a raving review wherever you get your podcasts. For more discussion on B2B social media marketing, be sure to follow Octopost on LinkedIn. And of course, to gain access to all our free social media marketing and employee advocacy resources, head on over to our website, www.octopost.com. Until next time.